welcome back to another episode on Genealogy TV. Today, we are talking about French Canadian research with Margaret Fortier. Now, if you're new here, my name is Connie Knox. I am a lifelong genealogist here to help you go further faster and factually with your family research. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell so that you get notified each time I upload a video. And well, let's talk about Margaret because she is a certified genealogist and she has done a couple episodes with us in the past. Uh, so we are very grateful to have her back again to talk about French Canadian research. Now, all the links that we talk about as well as a ton of information that she provided us is gonna be over at genealogytv.org. So make sure you check out the website and look in the blog post because that's where I'm gonna list everything because I don't think it's all gonna fit in the show notes below. I will put as much as I can in there, but I don't think it's all gonna fit. So check out the blog post. All right, here we go. Margaret, welcome back to another episode on Genealogy TV. I'm so glad you're back. I'm delighted to be back. Well, thanks so much for coming back. Today we're going to talk about uh, French Canadian research, but uh, for those of you at home who have not met Margaret before, she, uh, she did a couple episodes with us before, one on uh, immigration and naturalization. I absolutely love that episode. And um, on Italian research, if you have a, a Italian heritage in your background. I will leave information uh, flags at the top for those who can see it on the YouTube channel and also in the uh, show notes below and at genealogytv.org so you can find her all over the place. Oh, speaking of finding you, you are a professional researcher and I'm sure that people uh, that might want to uh, employ your services, how do they find you? They can find me in the Association of Professional Genealogists directory. Just look for Margaret Fortier, and it's a very easy search right from the homepage. You can also find me in the Board for Certification of Genealogists um, listing because I'm a certified genealogist, and I have a LinkedIn page. One. Margaret R. Fortier. You so kindly gave us a ton of resources, and I want to tell everybody about this up front because. Uh, Margaret here has provided us with a list of good resources. So that too will be at uh, genealogytv.org and in the show notes below. So uh, we really appreciate you doing that for us, Margaret. Oh, thank you. All right. So tell us, you're, I'm, I'm just going to turn it over to you and let you uh, <laughs> fly here. Where exactly are can, uh, French Canadian folks, ancestors to begin with? Well, they are originally... Um, settlers who came from France in the 1600s and they came to Quebec uh, which was owned by France until 1867 and they settled there and at a certain point in time for a variety of reasons they decided to leave and many of them came to the New England states they came to the upper Midwest primarily in fact, um, the New England states are sometimes called the Boston states in terms in the context of French Canadians. So, um, so there was a massive migration, almost a million of them came starting before the Civil War, but primarily more after the Civil War. And it can be a little challenging because of course the French names got uh, mangled by the English speaking um, Yankees mm -hmm. and um, so that presents some challenges but I have to tell you when I first started doing my genealogy I actually started with my husband's because Fortier he's, uh, he's uh, an originally French Canadian and I got started and I got them back to Canada to Quebec and then I got them all the way back to France but not because of my skill, but because the records are so good once you get into them. So if you have French Canadian genealogy, thank your lucky stars, because it is the best set of records on the planet for tracing you back to the 1600s. Really? Yes. I did not know that. Yes. Well, I know you brought some slides with you. Do you want to jump into those? Sure. So... 
everything changed for uh, French Canadians in Quebec in 1867 because the English um, had taken over. And at that point, French Canadian families were very large. Uh, they were, the fertility rate in French Canada was higher than any place in Europe. And they had only so much land, and they had a hereditary system where the, old, the, where the uh, land was divided among all the children. And that was set by the civil code, which was not easily changed. So as the generations went on, everybody got like less and less land, and the younger um, sons realized that it was not possible to make a living in Quebec. So they ended up looking for other opportunities. They also had crop failures and all kinds of things because they were farming in Quebec. And in Quebec, you have a short, humid summer and a long, cold winter and a very short growing season. So it was kind of difficult even to get going. You know, it just wasn't made for farming. So as you can see, Quebec is pretty large. It's actually twice the size of Texas. And it has 4,500 rivers, people traveled by the rivers, and half a million lakes. So it's very, uh, very water-based um, economy. So when they decided that they, that they couldn't stay, they looked around to see where they could go. Well, if you're farming, you're not going to go north because that's not gonna be any better. You would go west to Ontario and Western Canada, but the government wouldn't let you because you were French Canadian. You wouldn't go east to New Brunswick or Nova Scotia because those were English um, places and the English and the French were not friendly to each other. I had no so, idea. <laughs> so the logical place to go was south and east to New England and the upper Midwest. And that's where they went. Because as you can see, especially Maine is kind of right next to Quebec. And initially they came uh, primarily to Vermont, but then eventually they came to all the New England states. Wow. You know, I've not done a lot of studying up there. So this is, uh, this is, this is new to me too. So fascinating stuff. Yes, yes. So one thing that's important to know about French Canadians is that the way they immigrated was very different from the French Canadian pattern because Europeans had to cross a whole ocean. And once they crossed, they were separated from their origins. So because it was an expensive process, they ended up having the men go first and then the families came and they settled in cities and there were restrictions eventually on who could come over. But the French Canadians, because they were on adjacent land essentially, they could come by train and by river. You could get on the train in Montreal and be in Vermont in the afternoon. So they were adjacent to their origins and because of that and because it was cheaper, whole families came. And they, as I mentioned, they initially came to Vermont. It was cheap to immigrate, but the emotional cost was high because the French Canadians felt like they were leaving their way of life. Uh, it was called la survivance, and it was kind of a combination of family and the land and the religion because they were Roman Catholic. And coming into New England, which was very... Protestant and Yankee, it felt, um, it felt like they were leaving everything that was dear to them. So wow. it, was a, it was a very um, different experience. Also, they, um, because they came by land, there are not the same immigration records as there are for the people who came by ships. There are border crossing records, uh, Canada to the U.S. and U.S. to Canada, but they don't start until 1895. So 
you don't have a record of the people who came before them. And a it's lot kind of, of them, late, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is kind of late. And a lot of them went back and forth because it was so easy to do. So one of the challenges in doing French Canadian research is the names. When they got to the United States, a lot of them were anglicized. And this was because it was just easier to accept the way English speakers wanted to say the name than to constantly correct them. In addition, many of them, the early French Canadians, were not literate. So they couldn't even really correct them if they wanted. So you had surnames that transformed into other names. And this is um, pretty well documented. So if you were Bernier, you would become Barney. If you were Moreau, you would become Mero. So and you, and you look at these and they seem very English, Anglo kinds of names. If you were Parisot, you would become Parish. Saint Germain, you would become German. And that's tricky because now you don't even have the, the initial um, letter of Saint. It just goes away. It becomes German. Valois wow. became Valway. Uh, so very, very uh, different names. And you have to be aware of these to find them in the first census in the U.S., and in addition, just to make it a little bit more interesting, their first names would also change because some of them had very particular, unique French-Canadian names. So you had Hippolyte, which became Paul, because what else is it going to be, you know? Pascal would become Oscar. jean would be Jenny. Helena would be Lena, and there's many more of them. So you, ha you kind of have to deal with the first name and the last name. Is there a list anywhere that shows the equivalents like you have here for the, like? Um, I don't think there is one for the last names, but there are some for the first names. Because those are pretty dramatic the differences. First names, not the last names. I'm sorry, uh, say that again? There are some for the surnames, but I don't know that there are for the first names. I don't think I have. Um, I was just wondering, because those are pretty dramatic differences. Yeah, um, I would advise anyone who's doing serious French-Canadian research to try and hook up with a uh, French-Canadian genealogy society, because they are wonderful. They have fabulous resources, and they can really help you. They have very experienced people who can help you uh, decipher and figure out what you have to do. Good tip. So I have a little case study about my husband's great-grandmother, Mary Junot. She lived almost a whole century. And she was a little bit of a challenge because she was born in Vermont, or she was born in Quebec, depending on which record you looked at. And I looked at them all, and I tried to see, well, maybe if, maybe the early records said one place, and the late records said another place, or something like that. No pattern, just all over the map. And I was going crazy because I wanted to know where she was born. So I found some records that said she was born in a place called Sandustry. And I looked in the Canadian place names and in all the lists of geographical places, and there was no Sandustry. So then I thought, well, maybe it was supposed to be Saint someone. I thought, well, how many saints begin with D-U-S? And I looked for that, and I got nowhere. So then I found another record where I realized that it wasn't Sandistry in this record, it was Landistry. The S and the L in old script can look very similar. So I thought Landistry. And this is where knowing a little bit of French helped because I knew that in French, the I-N sound is pronounced an, Landistry. 
So then I looked for Landistry with the IN, and then I found it. It was in Joliet, and it was a little place whose name had changed 20 years before Marie was born. But on her records, they still used Landistry. So she was born in Quebec. Her family emigrated when she was three months old. So she had a birth record in Vermont and one in Quebec. So, wow. <laughs> so that was... That's some serious detective work on your part. Yes, yes. It took, it took me a long time. I mean, it wasn't quick, but I eventually found, found it out. Good job. So another tip, this kind of applies for all genealogy, but particularly for French Canadian, is to research the family. Because if you think about all those name changes on the first name and the last name, you have to know the family and the family structure to be able to find them. So my husband's name, Fortier, was uh, Furky in Vermont before the 20th century. And it was spelled Furky, Forky. I'm so glad they changed it back. <laughs> so in the US, they would be known as Peter and Jenny with children, Francis, Minnie, Lottie, Joseph, Victoria, and their mother, his mother-in-law, Delia Doyle. Well, in Quebec, they were Pierre, Jean-Vierve, Frazine, of one of those unique French-Canadian names, Marie Octavia, Charlotte, Israel, Marie Adeline, and Cordelia Daniel. So if you're just looking for Peter, and even if you know Peter is Pierre, if you don't have the rest of the family, you're going to be looking through tons of records. So that's why I say you, ha you have to know the family. You have to use the cluster research and the fan club. It will make your life much, much easier. You know, that's interesting because I was looking at Francis and Frazine, I think you said. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're working backwards and all you know is Francis, in my case, I have an ancestor whose name is Francis and she's born in Denmark and her original name was Francisca. So if, you, you know, I mean, going backwards, it could be a combination of a lot of different things. Right. You right. know, it yeah. could be, it could either, if you don't know whether they're coming from, you know, the French Canadian territory or they're coming from Denmark, you know, if you don't yeah. know and all you're dealing with is Francis, you've got a couple different options it could be. Right. And, and sometimes, I mean, some of these names, there's, there's kind of a connection like Lottie and Charlotte, but I have someone on my husband's side who was uh, christened Justine, like our Justine, mm -hmm. and she was Alcina in English, rec in, in, in U.S. records. So, wow. Sometimes you just... This is very helpful. One of the wonderful things about French Canadian research is the gold mine of vital records. And we have them thanks to Joseph Drouin. Uh, the Drouin collection is all on ancestry, all 16 million records, births, marriages, and burials. Uh, Drouin had these, uh, the, film, the, the copies that were made, they were filmed. And while they are predominantly Catholic, because that's what the most of French Canadians were, they do include all denominations. And the wonderful thing about these is that for the Catholic records, at least, and to some extent to the other um, denominations, they have a standard format. So even if they're hard to read or because they're illegible or the your handwriting isn't so good, you can at least know that it's always going to start out saying, this is the date, this is I baptized this child born of the legitimate marriage of this person and his wife, and they always give the maiden name, and they will um, give 
the godparents, and oftentimes if the godparents are related, they will tell you what the relationship is. So they'll tell you that the grandfather is the godfather. So once you have that, you can take it and go back because now you have the parents. So now you can look for the parents' marriage. And the marriage record will tell you their parents. So it's kind of like Russian nesting dolls. You know, you open one and you go in and you go back and you find more and more. <laughs> You're so, funny. <laughs> so they are fabulous, fabulous records. The trick is to get from the U.S. to the, to the latest Canadian record. So there's two strategies when you're dealing with French Canadian records. When you know the location in Quebec and when you don't. So when you know the location in Quebec, you're going to go and find the most recent marriage. And you're going to trace the parents of the bride and groom and the grandparents. And you're going to, of course, check for all other family members and associates, anyone who's named in the record. And you're, of course, going to note any other parishes because they will always say that the person is of this parish or if they're from a neighboring parish. And it is usually a neighboring parish. So the more common, I would say, situation is you have no idea where they are from in Quebec. You know they're French Canadian, but Quebec is a big place and there's a lot of them. So my suggestion is to search the Joanne collection by surname and date range. Not a first name, just the surname you're interested in and the dates that you're interested in. When you get the results from the list, you're going to know which locations have the most results, and you're going to start there. The Guide to Quebec Catholic Parishes um, can narrow your search. Um, this is available online in a couple of places. I think uh, Ancestry has it, um, Joanne has it, and you can uh, obviously get it at a library. So let me show you what this looks like. Oh, and use Google, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Always. So in this case, I'm looking for Junot, like uh, Marie's last name. And I'm looking for birth, and I just say 10 years either way, 1830 to 1850. I want to know where Junots are born in Quebec. And I get results that Repontigny is clearly the front runner for where the Junots were. Then you can go back in and say, okay, I just want to look at this location. And you can look through and see if any of the names fit the people that you're looking for. This is, um, this is kind of using probability to mm -hmm. narrow it down and, and kind of um, using, making smart use of your time. So yep. if you look through Repontigny and you find them, that's great. Now you can keep going. If you don't find them, then you look for the second most common name and you do the same thing. So it at least gets you closer to where you would want to be. So that is my good strategy. strategy. Yeah. It, uh, it can help because so many people, they don't have any idea where they're from because on the U.S. records, it will say Canada, it might say Quebec, it might say French Canada, but it doesn't usually tell you a specific location, which is what you really need. You know, I was just looking at the, um, the year range at the top there for this collection is, is yes, it's quite a, wide. That is wonderful. Yes, that, that's what I mean. It, there's just so many fabulous, fabulous records that if you can get them back to Quebec, you can get them all the way back to the original settlers because there are only 400 original settlers. So that's not really that many, and you can trace them back. That's amazing. You know, so you've got vital and church records in this collection. Are there any other groups within that collection? 
Um, I mean, that's quite a bit right there, but I'm just asking. They, um, not in that collection, but they do, they are starting to have notarial records, which are, um, can be very useful for fleshing out their lives. Um, they also included in this are um, marriage contracts, which are very useful because it gives you a lot of the um, social and economic status of the couple. Um, it names lots of relatives. So that's, that's another um, collection that's kind of alongside this one. One other thing I should mention is the use of D names, D, D I T. Um, D I T in French means called. Because there were only 400 original settlers as they married and multiplied, they decided to take a second name, a D name, to distinguish themselves from the other people with that name. So you had people who were Daigneau, and they would be called La Prise. So it would be Daigneau de La Prise. And in Canada, in Quebec, that wasn't a big problem because they kind of knew who they were. But when they came over to the United States, it became a challenge because sometimes they would use Danio and sometimes they would use La Prise. And there's no rhyme or reason to one or the other. So you also have to be aware that you may be dealing with an ancestor that has a D name. And in my list, one of the, one of the sites has them, an exhaustive list, which can be very, very useful because if you're looking for Daigneault, you're not looking for La Prise unless you know that it's a D name. And these, um, and, and both men and women used them. It isn't just men. So that's another uh, little challenge for French Canadian research. Great tip. That's good to know. Uh, you know, I, I think I see it here in your list. Oh yes, it's the last I item under reference, D names at the American French Genealogical Society. It's an exhaustive list. And- um, Oh, I see it now, oh, yes. Yeah. All right, so that'll be in the show notes as well and, and mm -hmm. on the web site at genealogytv.org. <laughs> um, are there tax records, census records, any other kind of records that we should know about, uh, you know, that are like governmental type records? There are Canadian census records, uh, which are every 10, for the most part, every 10 years, starting with, um, I think it's 1851. And those can be very useful. There are also a couple of earlier Quebec censuses. Um, there's an 1825, I think there's an 1842, um, which can be helpful. And so, there's one, I think it's the 1891 Canadian census that lists the exact birth date. One of them does. So they're, they're very useful. Um, and after the earliest ones, they are in English and French. So you don't have to um, Thankfully. <laughs> worry about it. But they're, they're pretty self-explanatory, you know, they're not, they're not too difficult. Well, nowadays, if you um, find that typewritten stuff on uh, the web somewhere, you can use Google Translate to, to at least kind of decipher what it could be. <laughs> Fabulous stuff. Did we miss anything? I would just suggest that if you really want to make progress with your French Canadian research, that you have a, a pocket French English dictionary um, and also learn the, the sounds of the French alphabet so that when you see a name in, um, in French, from French Canada, 
you have an idea of how it sounds. And I have some references in the, uh, that you'll have in the show notes for that because that can help you figure out what the name would be in the United States. And I think that, um, you know, you, and also you can use Google Translate and use the audio feature for how it's going to sound. So it's not that you have to do it all yourself. And you can say, oh, well, that could, I could see how that could be spelled this way in a U.S. record. And I think that's um, really useful. Well, I wish I had that when I was taking high school French. <laughs> <laughs> huh. I was having flashbacks when you were ta talking about some of this stuff. <laughs> I was not so good at French class. <laughs> so again, where can they find you? At, uh, on LinkedIn, on the Association Profession for Professional Genealogists, their directory, and the Board for Certification of Genealogists, their directory. Well, and I'll make sure that everybody gets a copy uh, or can see these notes because um, you've put together quite a list here, and I really appreciate that. Sure. As I'm sure everybody at home who has French-Canadian ancestry is going to be digging into that, so... Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, Margaret, thank you so much for all the great information. We really appreciate it. As always, all the information that we provide in these episodes, and boy, she provided a ton of extra stuff for this episode. All of that's going to be over at genealogytv.org, so make sure you check it out over there. Uh, Margaret also was here two times previous with the immigration and naturalization video, and then also the Italian research video. I will definitely get those two links in the top of the show notes of this episode if you want to see more from Margaret as well. Now, I'm curious, what branch of your tree are you working on right now? Surnames and a location. Put it in the comment sections below. We'd love to hear from you. And if you have any questions, please stick those in the comment sections. Uh, we always try and, and help out when we can. Now it's time for you to get back to your research. Until next time, keep on climbing your family tree.